We're not using the Wi-Fi in here, are we? It's really slow. Yeah. Maybe stop it and start it again. We're live? Oh, okay. Apparently we're live. So welcome to ARC for the week. Uh, tonight's message is continuation from Mark 9, where we started last week, and with a little bit of uh, James chapter 2 included. So let's pray and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you for bringing us together. We thank you, Lord. For all those who are joining us online, either now or in the days ahead, Lord, we pray that you would teach us according to your covenant. You said a man will not teach his neighbour to know you, but you yourself would teach us. You would write your law on our hearts and minds. Remember your covenant to uphold it, Lord. Shepherd us, go ahead of us and lead us. And bring as many as can be brought, Lord, along with us, so that we might share your joy in the salvation of as many as can be saved, even now in these perilous days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, tonight we're going to a little different part of Mark 9. We still won't be covering all of Mark 9 by any stretch because it's inspired in one chapter. It's got a huge amount in it. But if you've got, has everyone got a handout? Otherwise, there's some spares there. We're going to look in Mark 9. And verse 38. So if you've got your Bible, Mark 9, verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Jesus replied, do not stop him for no one who does a miracle in my name and the word there in the original is a word anoma. I'll explain that later. So he says, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name, because you belong to the Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. So this is one of those sections of scripture that when you read it in English for the first time, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because one minute we're talking about a guy they don't know that they found driving out demons in Jesus' name and next minute Jesus is talking about cups of cold water that don't seem to have what's one to do with the other, you would think, right? So let's dive in and see what it all means. So the first thing is what's the, what is the dilemma there's one here, Josh, if you want. You're right. um, what is the dilemma for the disciples here? It's the fact that someone they don't know, he's not a member of their group. Because remember at this stage, Christianity is not very, really established, right? So the disciples sort of all know each other. And here's a stranger, someone who's not one of us, in their words, and they find him casting out demons in Jesus' name. And they rush to their master and saying, Lord, Lord, there's some guy doing stuff in your name. What should we do? Do you understand what their confusion is? Because it's key to our study tonight. Their confusion is that they haven't talked to the guy. They haven't taught him anything. They don't even know him. And yet he's really casting out demons. In Jesus' name, how can that be? What do you think is going on in their heads? What is it that they're imagining? It's this. They think they're an exclusive club. They think that because they don't know him, how could he be a Christian? Because he's not in our club, how could he be one of us? So just keep that in the back of your mind because as we go through the scriptures tonight, New Testament that's not first in the old. That's the basis of Midrash, remember? So 
let's look where to find this, which is Isaiah 65. And he says, God says here through the prophet Isaiah, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation who did not call on my name, I said, here I am, here I am. What's God saying there? To understand this, you have to understand our from the other week about no one can come to me unless the Father draws them by his spirit. Remember we talked about Rivka, Rebecca the bride, how it's the servant who sent to get her, tells her about Isaac, and she agrees to come and be the bride, even though she's never met Isaac. Is she expecting, who do you think is the most surprised person that day? It's Rebecca. She's just watering her father's animals, right? She's not didn't wake up that morning thinking, I'll be packing my bags to go to my own wedding. It's a surprise to her. As it is to everybody that God sends his servant to. Who's the servant? It's the Holy Spirit, right? That's why Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. The servant is the one who does the bringing of the bride to Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So for, for you and for me and everybody else, that's really what happens. You're not expecting God to turn up in your life like he does. Especially if you're an ordinary person. You know, you don't think of yourself as anybody. And suddenly God Almighty says, Hey you, yep you, you're the one I'm talking to. Come and be a bride for my son. That's a pretty big deal. Found by those who are not seeking me. How, do, how does the church call this? They call it salvation by grace. What is grace? Can anyone remind me what grace means? The word? So the word in Greek is charis, right? Where you get charismatic from. It means gift. So is your Greek lesson for the day. If, you, if you're in Corinthians and you're looking at the gifts of the Spirit, that's the charisma, the gifts, right? So charis, grace, is the gift of God. But what does he give, actually? People incorrectly say that he gives salvation as a gift. He doesn't. He gives the opportunity as a gift. He invites people who were not looking for him. Just as Isaiah said, he calls to a nation who is not seeking him. He invites people who weren't looking for him. He gives them the gift of the opportunity to say yes. Why would I say it's not salvation itself, only the opportunity? Because remember, what did we learn from Rebecca? It has to be free will, remember? She could have said no. And that's how it is with God. He gifts us the opportunity to be saved. But if we say no, he doesn't make us be saved. He doesn't force anybody to come. It's not like that kind of arranged wedding, right? What has that got to do with what's happening in Mark 9? Well, their problem is about who do you call and therefore who should we call brother or sister in Christ? How do you define who we call brother or sister? How do we say they are one of us? What are the options? The options are, well, they have to belong to this church. And lots of churches are like that, unfortunately. <laughs> lots of churches are like that. But if you don't go to my church, you're not one of us. Do you think that's correct? Of course it's not. It's utter nonsense. If any church thinks that they are the body of Christ, you know, there's an old joke, I don't know if I should tell you, but I will anyway, because it's me, about 
someone going to, you know, some I think it was a Pentecostal or somebody going to heaven, and arriving, and St Peter takes him in to show him around. And there's a massive wall, goes all the way up to the sky, and you can't see the ends of it. And as they go past, Peter goes, he's like this, Shh, don't make any noise. And he goes, why? And he says, well, on the other side of the wall are the Baptists. He says, so? He says, they think they're the only ones here. It's a joke, but not a joke. That's lots of churches have that mentality. They really think that when, it, when they get to heaven, the only people that are going to be there are their members. That if you're not this denomination or that denomination, then you're not going to heaven. Which is why they fight each other to the death like they do, why there's been wars over it. You know, with millions of people killed. There was a war in Europe for 30 years. 30 years. That's longer than, the, you know, the whole thing in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's only 20. So a war between Protestants and Catholics for 30 years with millions of people killed. Swords and the axes we're talking about. Over it. <clears throat> Ridiculous, right? The question for these disciples about this guy is, should we be calling that guy a brother or sister since we don't know him? How, did, how can he be using the name of my rabbi when he's not one of us? This is a much more important question than it might first seem. We have to know, who is your brother and sister? Who can you fellowship with comfortably and who in the church do you need to be a bit guarded around? You don't reject them, by the way. Let's get that right out of the way. But you do need to be a bit guarded around some people, right? So should we do the midrush thing? We'll start with the obvious. So the obvious people to be a bit guarded around is what? It's people who you know their doctrine is completely off. You know? because there are lots of things that call themselves Christianity, but even the unsaved, no, they're not, okay? Does this mean you never talk to them? Heck no. One of the longest conversations I ever had, and the closest probably I came to ever going home and shooting myself, was with a guy evangelizing in the main street, and he's a Mooney. If you don't know the Moonies, they were a Korean, um, prosperity cult Sun Young Moon his name was who said he was the Messiah and millions of people believed him and they used to have mass weddings like 2,000 couples at a time and most of them had never met each other he used to select who you're going to marry but totally bizarre he ended up in jail thank God and then he died there so you know God won in the end on that. But I knew all that before I started talking to the guy, right? Does this mean I should have just, like, gone around? What about those really usually innocent young people, wide-eyed and enthusiastic, who want to give you one of those Hare Krishna books in the main street? Have you run into them? Yeah. You know? So what do you do? Do you get your, you know... You get your crucifix out and going, back, Satan, you know? Because they're following something demonic, right? But people do, maybe not that extreme, but in their hearts that's what they're doing, right? They cross the road or they, whatever. Is that what we're supposed to do? No, but we have to be cautious, right? That's my point. We have to know who can I sit with as a brother or a sister confidently in Christ and who do I need to be, who do I need to treat not assuming they're saved already, you know? So sometimes it's easy, one of those girls with a Hare Krishna book, easy. You know, the Mooney in the street, easy, right? What about someone from a prosperity cult? 
who, who knows that Jesus is the Son of God, who largely agrees with you, but in really dangerous ways is living a lie. This is where it gets harder, right? So hopefully, as we go through, we'll look at what, how Jesus deals with us and we'll understand what to do. Because for sure, you are going to be in that situation. Right? They used to, can you believe when I was 27 and even younger than I am now, even younger, they used to send me on youth conferences as the, as the youth delegate for the Salvation Army. Imagine that, me, youth. Except I go to these things, so every other Christian denomination in the country would be there. You know, pick a church, they had their youth there. And I discovered after the first day that it was only me and about three other people in a room of about 50 that actually read the Bible and believed anything in it. And I even had someone at the lunch hour say, oh, they came up to me and they said, I was listening to what you were saying. You don't actually believe what the Bible says, do you? This is the youth delegate for the Methodist church, I remember. You know, his church was the first church in New Zealand to ordain gay ministers. So you imagine how mixed up he was, right? So what are you supposed to do? You know, again, do you leap out with your crucifix and your garlic and like back Satan, you know? What's the key? The key is what we mentioned last week. Jesus came for who? Sinners. He came to give sight to the blind. He came to so that those who are deaf would be able to hear, those who are in chains could be set free. Just because they've got a Jesus sticker on, you know, doesn't mean that they don't need to hear the same testimony from you as the girl with the Hare Krishna book. And you might think, how do I do that? Well, actually, it's really easy because it's been our theme for a few weeks. How many standards should we run? How many measures should we apply? Just one. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, remember? What measure should we use then? Christ-likeness. It shouldn't matter who's in front of you. It shouldn't matter a bean who's in front of you. You should apply that one measure, whether it's the Hare Krishna girl or the youth rep from some really wacky church who, after 10 seconds, you realise doesn't know Jesus at all. Who should you be in the conversation? You should be Christ's witness. Not as a job or a hat that you put on, say, oh, I'm going evangelising now, and you put your Christian hat on. It should be you, who you are. One measure all the time. That measure in your, in your marriage, that measure with your children, that measure in your job, that measure in your church, that measure in the street when you're accosted by someone who wants you to be a Hare Krishna. You know? I can almost hear you all thinking, now that sounds good, but I don't want to do it. Why don't you want to do it? I'll tell you why, because you're thinking, what will I say? You know, let's, let's uh, this is not in the thing, but let's just say that you've run into that Hare Krishna girl and she's lovely and nice and smiling at you and holding out this deadly lethal book full of supernatural poison, you know, unwittingly wanting to aid Satan in your eternal death, right? Because the Hare Krishna's worship a demon, in case you don't know. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to be naming them. But how's, what's the only thing that person's likely to respond to? If you think, oh, that's right, I'm a, I'm a Christian, 
let me think of a clever scripture, let me think of a sermon, let me think of something. While you're busily working out which outward appearance to put on, do you think they won't notice? If you switch on your evangelist switch and then go into I'm giving you a Christian lecture mode, do you think they won't notice? Do you think they'll take it as real? I know it won't work on me. I've had it happen. You know, my, I always used to meet a friend in Courtney Place every Friday night and we'd go out and it's cold in Wellington, right? So it happened to me several times I'd be sitting on one of those benches at the bottom of Cuba Street in my leather jacket and my Doc Martens and my black jeans sitting in the cold like this on the park bench by myself and these Christians would sit down either side of me and start evangelising me. I just let them go for it. You know, why should I stop them? And then when they finish, they say, they say well, what are you thinking? And I was, think, I was thinking, I'm thinking that was a really good message. And I might even come and visit you at your church. And they're like, oh, really? It says, yeah, one condition. And they go, what's that? It says, you come and visit me at mine first. <laughs> you know? And then I go like that. It says, already got. And they, they look at me like, but you don't look like a Christian. <laughs> no? They're lovely people, but, you know, so the only, th I know what it's like to be, have Christianity pitched at me. Well-meaning, doesn't work. Because the human spirit can tell when it's not who's actually talking, when it's, <laughs> an, when it's a show, when it's an act. You know? So the only way you're ever going to really be effective is to never treat ministry as something else that you do from apart from your normal life. You should be in ministry 24-7. How do I do that? Be a Christian. Make that who you are. So you have another mode. So that your whatever comes out of your mouth is coming out of your faith within you. And then you will just be real. Does that make sense? And you'd be surprised how much more effective that is. And he, always, he makes a promise. He says, if you have to testify about me, do not worry what you will say. From that very hour, the Spirit will teach you what to say. I always rely on that. Does this mean you'll see them like hit the ground in repentance straight away? Not usually. Because you don't know whether you are the planter of a seed or the waterer of a seed someone else planted or you're going to be there for the harvest. You just do your part. Anyhow, one measure, right? One measure. So what Jesus says to them is interesting because what can we say about the guy they don't know who he is, right? He's not in the club, as far as they're concerned. They don't understand how he could be using the name of their rabbi when he's not one of them. You know? But notice, what is the guy actually doing? There's no question about it. He's actually, actually driving out demons. Actually. So that's the first indisputable point that the disciples should have taken notice of. It's not a show. The demons are actually fleeing when this he commands them to leave. Now remember this word here where it says, how is he doing it? He's doing it in the name of Jesus, but the word here in Greek is onoma. Onoma is the same, it's Greek, right? Because this is New Testament, so it's written in Greek. So he's, it's in, the disciples are saying to Jesus, in your anoma, he's driving out demons. What does anoma mean? It's a, the Greek word with the same meaning as Shem. So just like Shem in Hebrew, Shem doesn't just mean your name, Warwick. It means your whole character. 
So in the name of Jesus, when Jesus says, whatever you ask for in my name will be done for you, does not mean by adding in Jesus' name on it. It means in his character, consistent with him. Shem, right? In the Greek, it says anoma, but the two words have the identical meaning. That's the next thing that this tells you, that this guy was not just some random using his own will and just sticking in Jesus' name on the end like a magic spell, like I've seen people do so many times and then wonder why nothing happens. The use of that word means that the disciples recognise and Jesus confirms it by what he replies. That this guy they don't know isn't just driving out demons, he's doing it in Christ, in the character of Jesus. That's the key. They don't know him, but he's doing it in the character of their rabbi, their Messiah, and the demons are really fleeing. Ask yourself a question. What can make a demon flee? The list is very short. What can make a demon flee? There's only two things that can make a demon flee. A bigger demon. <laughs> or God. Right? So if it was just that he was casting out demons... It could be one or the other. But because the, the disciples themselves, no doubt under the influence of the Spirit, they say, he's doing it in your, or switch to Hebrew, in your Shem, in your character, tells us that God is honouring this guy's <coughs> ministry, his effort. That the Holy Spirit is on this guy. That the Holy Spirit is present. <coughs> that even though the disciples don't know him, who does know him? God. When he commands in Jesus' name, these demons leave. It's, do you want, do you need, Abby, do you need? That's the key. And then look what Jesus says. Do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name, again, that's a anoma, so in my character, no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. What's Jesus saying there? If you experience a miracle of God, let's start with the easy one, right? If you <coughs> experience genuine, miraculous God things, as I testified in that, when I did that online one, you know that it's irrational not to believe in Jesus, if you've seen that. If not, please do. people behave the Toronto thing God held me in the storm by reminding me of all the genuine miracles he had done in front of me and done through me and done for me a long list genuine stuff which I've shared with you before so we won't repeat it here if you want to hear it again you can go and just watch that online it's the one I think it's the one that's it's irrational not to believe in Jesus. So. so the easy case is if you've experienced a really overt miracle, a demon being driven out or someone being genuinely healed or something like that, right? Because it becomes then an indisputable fact, an indisputable rational fact. It doesn't require any blind faith. It requires more faith to not believe in him than to believe in him because you've got this unavoidable evidence in front of you that God is real and Jesus is real 
and everything is subject to him, right? But how many of you have seen a miracle like that, apart from me? I don't know. So at the moment, you have to take my word for it. Like, I wouldn't lie to you about something like that, right? Wouldn't lie to you about anything. But, but you all actually experience miracles and you've all experienced a particularly important miracle already, which is your own salvation. Your own salvation. It says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. God is more often found in like dripping water that slowly erodes a rock. You know, God miraculously saves you, miraculously changes you, transforms your life, leads you, guides you in lots of little drops rather than a tsunami. <coughs> Why doesn't God do the tsunami thing? Why isn't there just this massive move of the Holy Spirit in your life and big flash of light and boom, you're a, you know, whatever? Why not? Because you die. Humans cannot actually handle change very much at a time. The World Health Organization have a list of things called stressors, things that initiate stress, right? And each, they're all weighted. So if you get a score above eight, you will almost certainly end up with some kind of medical condition related to stress, right? We used to use it as an analytic tool in counselling. But when you look at the list, it's things like breaking up with your girlfriend, getting married. Moving house has the same score as your partner dying. Wow. Moving house is one of the most stressful things humans experience, right? So we are not particularly <laughs> well adapted to big change. But God needs to change us completely, right? <laughs> doesn't he? If he did all the change he wants to do in one blast, you would just not endure it. You would fall to pieces, right? So what does he do? He erodes away the old man and grows up the new man in its place, drop at a time, like water eroding a rock. The Holy Spirit works on you day after day after day, day and night. A little thing here, a little thing there, once in a while, a bigger thing, but never more than you can actually endure and survive to come out the other side more than you were. We're all familiar with supernatural God. We're all familiar with miracles. But we've been trained to only see those big light and magic things as the miracles. The greater miracle is that sinners get saved. That God invites sinners to heaven, that there is a way at all, that he takes ordinary people. I don't know anyone in this room, including me, that's not ordinary. You know? Everyone's ordinary, ultimately. Ask their mothers. <laughs> you know? So, we can say confidently, what Jesus says applies, for sure it applies if you're casting out demons or something, You'll never be able to unbelieve in Jesus after that. But even if you haven't seen that kind of miracle, if you stop and think about it, the greater miracle of your own salvation or the greater miracle of the salvation of people that you love and witness to just by your life, seeing them change, seeing them become more confident, able to stand even in the storm, all those little things constantly... It's very hard to unbelieve Jesus once you've got a collection of that in your life. That's what Jesus was saying. No one can do a miracle in my character and then have something bad to say about me. No. What then is the more important thing in what the guy was doing. 
the fact that he's casting out demons or the fact that he's doing it in the character of Christ? Which is the more impressive thing? <coughs> it's that it's in the character of Christ. <coughs> Lots of cultures do battle with demons. Shamans, in, you know, um, like in Japan or the Shinto religion in Japan, the priests deliberately get themselves, invite demons to take them over to fight other demons. Clever, right? No. Overtly I'm talking about, deliberately, right? Shamans around the rest of Asia, the same. You'll go to a witch doctor in Africa to deal with demons. It's a demon being called on to fight another demon. Why would they do that? What's the fundamental what's the fundamental aspect of Satan's character? Pride. I've got a demon problem, Mr. Demon, but you're a better demon. You can deal with my demon, can't you? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I can. You know? Besides which, when Satan puts on a show like that, he causes people to get hooked on that supernatural power. Right? I told you the story of the first Salvation Army missionary to Africa. He had to beg William Booth to let him to go because they had no one in Africa anywhere. And the Salvation Army was still young, didn't have much money or anything. He begged and begged and begged. And so Booth let him and his wife go. And three years later, they had precisely zero converts because the area they went the only people that came to church was the people they paid, which was their housekeeper and their gardener and uh, someone else that they paid to do things. So almost out of sympathy, the household staff would be the only people that would attend church. And he would nevertheless give his sermon, and she played the organ and sang hymns. Three years of that, right, knowing. And he was going to give up because he knew he could never deal with the witch doctors People would listen, but they were so their faith was in the magic of the witch doctors, which is real. It's demonic, right? But it's real. So he even told Booth that he thought he was a failure, he had to come home. But a drought came. <coughs> and it was so bad, so bad. People were dying, everything's dying. Unbeknownst to him, the paramount chief of the area went to every single witch doctor in the massive region. That's a lot of witch doctors, right? And demanded that they make it rain. This is just like the prophets of Baal. Demanded that they make it rain. Just how many raindrops fell? None. So when he ran out of witch doctors to ask, he went to what he probably presumed was just another witch doctor, <laughs> the white guy, and he said, if your God can make it rain, I will serve him, and I will require everyone else to as well. <coughs> you know? And this young guy suddenly realised how small his faith was, and he realised that all he had to do was make it rain, and all his prayers for like Christianity to come to that area would be answered. One small problem, you have to make it rain, as a drought. And he didn't have a choice. The, the next thing the chief told him was, I've set the date, it's this day, and everyone's coming to watch you make it rain, since you have told us that your God is the God above all gods and all the rest of it, right? It's where the rubber hits the road, right? His wife and him were just beside themselves with horror but they couldn't run the day came she set up her organ and they played hymns and sang hymns for as long as they could putting off the moment and the whole time he spent inwardly crying before God apologizing for ever having come and being so presumptuous as to come and think he could be a priest 
you know, because now he was going to shame God publicly by not failing. God didn't answer him right. So his faith, of everyone there, his faith was the least. He's a broken man, right? It's not a cloud anywhere. He'd been praying fervently for rain, obviously. Not a cloud. As far as I could see, blue sky to the heavens everywhere. And there's been people filing in from all over the place. All the different sub-tribes all walked to this place, right? And these old men would sit down and all their sons and daughters and their wives would sit with them in a group. Right at the end, out of the heat mirage, there's one old guy arrives. He's the last to arrive with all his wives and everything else. Really ancient old man. And he's staring straight into the eyes of this young priest. Really intimidating. And you know what was most intimidating about him? He's got an umbrella. And he thought to himself, this is just so bad. The only guy that bought an umbrella is the pagan. The Christian priest didn't bring one. <laughs> he just... <laughs> anyway, instead of some clever prayer, he looked at heaven and said, it's in your hands, Lord. If it's your will for these people, bring the rain. <clears throat> he shut his eyes, looked at the ground, and then people started shouting. Because over the mountain, what appeared? A great big black cloud. And then another one. And before you know it, everyone's running in all directions. Because it's like a monsoon. It's absolutely hammering down. And the only guy who went home dry was the old guy with his umbrella, who apparently stood up looked him in the eye again, turned around and walked back the way he came under his umbrella. And the chief kept his word. And the witch doctors, just like the prophets of Baal, could do nothing. Nothing. When it's really God, it's really God. Right? The witch doctors, who could drive out demons party trick but when it was in God's will and in his character God can do things that demons cannot right? that's why of the two things it's the fact that the guy is doing it in his character that is the key thing the key thing now <coughs> what would that tell us for our own lives then What's the most important thing for our going around in our ministry and things like that? What if you're that young missionary? Right? What's the most important thing then? That you've got a clever sermon? That you have a great praise band? Or, I don't know, that you hand out a lot of really good clothes or something? What do you think is the only thing that really ultimately matters at all? What Jesus says here matters that you do it, whatever it is that you're doing, it's not what you're doing that matters, it's how you do it. It's that you do it in his shem, in his character, that one measure, remember? Treat everyone, be Christ-like. Don't worry about who's in front of you. Shouldn't make any difference. Jesus had to deal with every kind of person, so do we. Do you see Jesus wearing, having multiple personalities? No. That's our key lesson, our key. So why does he say something that seems a little bit weird? In verse 40 he says, For everyone who is not against us is for us. Doesn't that seem back to front? In fact, when people quote this, they often do switch the order and they'll say, you know, if, if you're for us, you're not against us. But that's not what Jesus says. Everyone who is not against us is for us. <clears throat> it sounds a bit back to front. What is he really saying? To understand it, we need to go to John, we're on page two, we need to go to John 15 and verse 18. 
where we see Jesus telling us something about the reality of being a Christian. It says here, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Take note, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. That's from John 13, verse 16, in case you don't know. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my, and that's anoma again, my character, right? So if you're in his character, the same people that were horrible to him will be horrible to you. The servant is not greater than the master, right? As they treated him, so they will treat his servants. Then we'll skip a bit, right down to verse 25, quoting from Psalm 35. He says this, These, All of that happened, them hating him, whilst to fulfill what is written in the law, they hated me without reason. They hated me without reason. Incidentally, if you've ever in Matthew where it talks about if anyone murders, right, but then he says, but if any of you hate your brother, that Jesus says that's the same as the sin of murder, right? It doesn't make sense in English. It's the same thing. It's to hate someone without reason, to just be hateful, because that's an issue of your character, nothing to do with them. Does that make sense? So if you just treat someone in a hateful way because it's that's you and they have done nothing. Classic cases like abuse, right? Then that will destroy that person in the end. If you have to if you ever deal with people who've suffered from like sexual abuse or family violence, things like that, the abuser may as well have murdered them the result ends up the same. So that's what Jesus was saying. So if you're wondering, if you're trying to work out that distinction, it has the same meaning here, from Psalm 35, 19. Anyway, the key of that in John there is what Jesus is saying is, don't be surprised if you're really my disciple, if you're reflecting me, if you're using that one measure. Don't be surprised when people treat you the way they treated me. Because the student is not above the master. If they treated me this way, they'll treat you. Okay, now, we're doing narrow way, right? So statistically, out of a population, what does Jesus say about those who find the narrow way? How many? It's only a few. Even if we're generous and say it's only a relative few, right? So it'll still be a lot of people, but relatively few out of the whole population. That means that most people will not love Jesus. What does that mean for you? Most people will not love you in the world. They will treat you the way the world treated them. It gets a bit less scary though. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those who are the descendants of the Pharisees, the religious Jews, and those who are like the Romans. What's the thing about the Romans and Jesus? How did they treat him? This is really important. How did the Romans treat Jesus? generally. If you're struggling to think of anything, that's because largely they didn't treat him at all. They largely completely and utterly ignored him as completely and utterly irrelevant. They didn't see him as a threat to Rome. They didn't see him as anything more than some crazy guy, you know, walking around making speeches about something in Aramaic that they didn't understand anyway. But he was no threat to them. They largely ignored him. 
That's what the world will largely do to you. They might laugh at your faith. They might think you're a bit weird. But largely, beyond treating you like being a bit silly, they're not that much of a threat. They don't really generally do anything. The dangerous ones are the religious people who are not Christ's but claim to be God's in the character of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, right? That's why Jesus says in the last days, your enemies will be the members of your own house. He's talking about the church. Okay? So even though it's most people won't love you, it's a relatively small number of people that will actively and passionately hate you, and they'll be religious. As for the master, so for the servants, right? Most of the world will just ignore you at most think you're a bit crazy or whatever right so you don't have to get too stressed about that but again remember our question who can we be comfortable with as a brother and sister and who do we need to be a little bit guarded that starts to answer our question that if it's just the world if it's that Hare Krishna girl is actually less dangerous than someone who goes who says they're Christian but aren't from some culty thing or something, right? They are the people you need to have your guard up far more than dealing with someone in the street. Where do we get to? Uh, we can go over to page three. So then back in Mark 9, Jesus does what seems to be a slightly odd thing we're talking about the guys driving out demons and Jesus is saying, you know, no, no, don't drive him away. Even though you don't know him, he's one of us, right? No one can be doing that unless it's my father at work, right? You know, so paraphrasing, Jesus is saying, you don't know him, but he's a brother. Because only a brother can do that. Only if the Holy Spirit's with that person, then... Otherwise, he couldn't be doing that. So even though you don't know him, even though he's not from your Bible study, even though he's not from your church, he's one of us. That's what Jesus is saying. <coughs> but then he switches. It seems like he switches to apparently unrelated thing. He says in verse 41, he says, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ. Truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. What's that got to do with casting out demons? Nothing. Why does Jesus suddenly drop this in right there? How does it relate? We need to understand. So what's Jesus saying? Look at it closely. What is the cup of cold water about? The whole point of it is it's just a cup of cold water. The whole point is it's like nothing. It doesn't even cost any money. You know? It's the easiest thing. Can I have a cup of water? Sure. What does that cost me? Nothing. But Jesus is saying even a cup of cold water will not go without its reward in the kingdom. So even the small thing, even the little things, matter right what makes it important look at the sentence closely because of your name as my disciple it's about motivation the reward in the kingdom comes because of the attitude of the giver's heart the, because the reason they are quick to say sure sure let me get you a drink is because you're a disciple of christ what does that say about the person giving it? What's their attitude in their heart? They're giving it because you're Christ's disciple. What does that say about their attitude toward Jesus? They know him? He matters to them? Yes. And because you belong to him, you matter to them as well. This is talking about someone who's moved by the fact that you're a brother or a sister. 
who's moved by the fact that you belong to Christ and therefore of all people you are someone they almost need to help. This is the body looking after the other parts of the body. And the key thing is here, I don't know about people here, but it's wherever I go, it's always been true that people look at the people on in the pulpit or on the stage or, or in the praise band or whatever, and they think, oh, I can't preach, oh, I can't play the guitar. I definitely can't play the guitar in case you're wondering. And they think, well, you know, what can I do that will ever mean anything? You know, what part could I play in ministry that would God would even notice? Really? What did Jesus just say? Even the giving of something as simple as a cold cup of water with the right motivation will not fail to receive a reward in the kingdom. He's still talking about that guy casting out demons, actually. Why is he casting out demons? Because he's, he's doing it in the character of Christ. What's motivating his heart? Putting on a show like a witch doctor? No, the whole point is what he's doing is moved by the Holy Spirit. He's casting out demons out of, because it's in the character of Christ, with the same motivation as Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about here. You don't know this guy, but whatever he's doing, motivated by me, will not go without its rewards. Even if all he was doing was giving a cup of cold water to one of you because you're mine. So it's not the fact that it's something grand like casting out a demon. That's Jesus' point. It's all about the heart motivation. The heart motivation. And we can demonstrate that. Just one scripture on its own is not enough of a witness, right? We need at least two. So we find that in Matthew 25. So Matthew 25, Jesus is talk about, talking about separating the sheep from the goats at the judgment. So that's what he's talking about. And we pick it up here in verse 34. It says, Then the king will say, so he's talking about himself, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Then look what it says. Because I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. He's talking in the first person, right? He's not he does he's not saying there was this guy and he was sick and you went to him and there was this other guy and he was hungry and you gave him some food. He's talking in the first person. I was hungry, I was sick, right? Why? Remember a while ago we talked about the two different titles for Messiah. Is Jesus the Son of God and Jesus the Son of Man? And whenever, we, whenever he talks about himself as the Son of Man, it means he's identifying with us. You know, God came down, took on bodily form to identify with us. That's what he's doing here. He doesn't mean literally that he was hungry. It means someone was hungry and I identify with that. I was with them in it. And you are the help that came. You were motivated by me, by your faith in me, to help that person. When you help that person... You helped me. When you fed that person, you fed me. Because I was with that person. I was identifying with them in their hunger. And I know what I knew what it was to be hungry. I knew what it was to be sick with them. And you came. When you did it for them, you did it for me. So look what he says. The righteous say unto him and say, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes you? They're really confused, right? When did we see you sick in prison or go to visit you? And the king will reply, this is so important, own this next thing. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me, for the least of brothers and sisters of mine. So this is primarily talking about within the body, right? Not Christian charity to the unsaved. That still matters. But this is primarily talking about the body parts looking after the other body parts. You know? The same meaning as it has up there in Mark 9 where he says, We're giving a cup of cold water because you're my disciple. The same thing is here. These were brothers and sisters of mine, means they're Christian. When you did it for them, you were really doing it for me. What's the consequence here? In Mark, he says, you will not fail to receive a reward, right? In Matthew 25, it's a bit more serious. What's the consequence here? What's Jesus doing again? He's separating the sheep from the goats. He's separating the real Christians from the fake ones. What's the test? Not that you ran out and did all this social work. It's the motivation. You did it. When you did it for them, you were doing it for me. The, the motivation of your heart was Christ. Do you understand? There's a flip side to this that we'll see in a second. 1 Corinthians 12, if you've got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20, uh, verse 26. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the body of Christ being made up of many parts, each part with a different role, all of them important. And there's one part that joins them all together at the top and that's the head, right? And who's the head of the body? Christ himself. So we are, none of us are the body of Christ. We're only a body part. That's why we're all different. We have different callings, different abilities, different anointings, so on. The, but what makes us brothers and sisters is what joins us, that we're all connected to the same head, Christ. The only unity that means anything in Christendom is that each part is joined to Christ and therefore they all are joined by virtue of being joined to Christ. Right? That's the only valid meaning of unity in Christianity. Then he says, so with that in mind, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26, he says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Everything Jesus does, everything, even in ministry, it all happens through the body. God doesn't, well, almost never will God operate through one superhero guy. So all those mega churches you see with their superstar preachers, where the whole place revolves around one like superhero Christian, is that likely to be God? Very, 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 very unlikely. He doesn't work like that. He works through the body. He doesn't have the guy at the front and everyone else is a spectator. That's a dead body. Right? All of the body parts have a function. And the thing he's saying here is that if any of the body parts are injured, the whole body hurts. Key thing. If you stub your toe, how does your head feel? What is your head experience? Pain, right? What do you think it's like for the body of Christ? If some small, extreme, tiny part gets really injured, how does the head feel? What is the head experience? 
pain. Whatever happens to any part of the body of Christ, the head of that body, Jesus himself, suffers. That's what he's saying. That's what he means by whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Because if they're part of the body, there's no way that what they're experiencing as an individual part is separate from what he experiences as the head of the body. People say when you're experiencing grief or trials, he's there right in it with you. This is another way of explaining that same thing. He's right there in it with you. In the same scripture, we learn something else too. 1 Corinthians 12, but this time in verse 22 and 23. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. This is why Jesus is emphasising that when you did this for the least of my people, you did it for me. Because in the body, the value to God of the parts has nothing to do with the size of your ministry, the greatness of your ability, you know, in God's economy. What seems the least part in the body, I don't know who that is, maybe someone that you don't even know what they do because they, they do all their serving away during the week when you're not even looking. Or maybe they just put the chairs out or something. But God is not like a man. God is not like us. He's making it clear here that he is with the small and I'll explain that again in a minute. But again, take special note. The consequences of Matthew 25 are pretty and serious. It's what separates the sheep from the goats. Heart attitude. You know? So how do I achieve this? If I want to be a real sheep, how do I want to make sure that I'm on the right side of the ledger here? Once again, it's easy. It's just the one thing we keep repeating. Just use one measure. Don't worry about who it is. Don't worry about whether it's a great person or a small person, a famous person or a, a nobody according to the world. You shouldn't treat them any different. Be Christ-like. You know? And especially all the more if they are part of the body because God prioritises the body. Our first priority is to take care of the other body parts. It's a priority. Right? We're also supposed to love our enemies, let alone those who are just lost, right? So yes, but there's a priority of order, maybe it's a whole Bible study in itself. Our first priority is to look after the other parts of the body. Here's a pop quiz. Are all the parts of the body just in the ark? Remember the guy casting out the demons? What was Jesus saying to them about him? You don't think he's one of us, but he's a body part. You know? So when you're doing this prioritising, what's the first thing you don't do? You don't ask what church they go to. You don't hang your decision on whether... You know, they're Christian enough to get your help. Do you understand? The least part is the most important according to Christ. So just have that one standard. It means you only have to be one person. You don't have to be schizophrenic, multiple personalities. You know, it's one. And when you realise someone is a believer, take special care to care for them. 
take special care to not walk by. You know? Go the extra mile all the more because there's a priority about looking after the body parts. So I'm going to hop out of Mark 9 now to continue the same topic, but jumping to James chapter 2. So we're just bottom of page 3. My brother, so this is James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. James makes it clear, first sentence, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. And if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. So this is about in the church, right? Make sure you understand that. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in the scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, which we must, it's a command of Christ, remember. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. But he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown for anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we need to understand what this means because most people just stare at it and have no clue. Because it sounds like James is going back to the law, right? He's not. His point is about favoritism. Remember, first rule, Keep it in context. He's talking about you, you may not show favoritism. So when he starts talking about the law there, what he means is if you say, I'm not an adulterer, but you are a murderer, does this mean you're okay? Because you're not an adulterer? That He's saying God is impartial in his law. He shows no favoritism. Just because you're not an assaulter does not get you off the fact that you're a murderer. That's what he's saying. God himself made it clear, and we'll see in a second, that he applies his law impartially, without favoritism. Neither to the rich. I don't know if you know this, but contrary to like liberal thinking, like you know, we have in the government today. Do you think that it's Christian? Warning, this is a one of my booby trap questions. It's a hint. Do you think it's Christian to show give poor people special treatment? Should we have a lower standard of expectation for law keeping or you know should we tolerate things we wouldn't tolerate with rich people but should we tolerate them because they're poor right? but that's what the, that's what our society does right it makes excuses all based on the fact that you're poor you know so if you ran, if if you if you did a ram raid in your ferrari and grabbed some jewellery and ran off, they'd say, oh, this rich guy, throw him in jail. 
but if some poor person from South Auckland does a ram read, everyone's like, oh, but they're poor. Oh, no, we have to make a special case because they're poor. Here's a, something you probably don't know. In the law, God's law, he expressly says, expressly says, you must not show favoritism to the poor. Favoritism. He holds the poor to the same standard. Being poor, he does not accept as an excuse for immorality, as an excuse for lawlessness, unlike our society. So we're not to favour the rich, but we're not to favour the poor either. We are to be impartial. Impartial. We can show sympathy and extra mercy, but as far as sin goes, God is impartial. Just because you're poor or had an underprivileged upbringing or whatever, sin is sin. There's no special get-out-of-jail-free card because you grew up in Maori or something, you know? So rich and poor alike, they face the same God who has the same standard that he applies impartially. Then it, um, then it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You have to understand what that means. So to help us, need to look at the actual law or an example of the actual law and you know when people talk about we're no longer under the law and they think that God used to be strict and now he's not that things like grace are something that God invented for the New Testament I meet people like this all the time they think that God didn't used to be gracious that there didn't used to be grace it was all law and then God had a personality transplant, you know? And now suddenly he's like all forgiving and, you know, there's no law and just do what you like and he'll just forgive you, which would require God to have massively changed to have done a flip, a complete reverse flip personality, right? Whereas we know my favorite scripture, Malachi 3, I, the Lord, do not change. Why? So that you can be saved. That's what he says. So what we're going to look at is Deuteronomy 10, and I want to use this to demonstrate to you that the Old Testament is already about grace. It's already about mercy, that the law itself requires mercy. The law itself requires grace. The law itself requires us to behave as Jesus is teaching. Jesus is actually teaching what the law itself requires. God's law doesn't go away. Jesus just teaches us how to live by it. Let's have a look. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16. Circumcise your hearts. Remember, in, this is in Hebrew, right? So that in, in your heart means in your innermost being. It doesn't mean the actual organ. In the Hebrew word, it means your, your innermost person. So circumcise your innermost person. What is circumcision about? Entering the covenant, right? So this is a way of saying... Make sure that you are in covenant with God inwardly and not merely by outward appearances. That's what this means. Make sure you're real, in other words. Um, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked. What does stiff-necked mean? It's a whole Bible study on donkeys. Has anyone dealt with a donkey, a real one? If a donkey doesn't want to go where you want to go, what does it do? It just points its head where it wants to go, and unless you're a superman, you cannot move it because the muscles on a donkey's neck are stronger than in a horse. You know, that's why they're such good pack animals. They're unbelievably strong for their size. They're stronger than a horse. That's why for pack animals, they used to breed horses and donkeys together to make mules. So you get horse-sized animals with the strength of a donkey. Right? 
But if a donkey stiffens its neck, it does so out of stubbornness. You know? People talk about being as stubborn as a mule. That's an American saying, because Americans are more used to mules than donkeys, right? But the stubborn side of mules comes from the fact that they're half donkey. If a donkey decides it doesn't want to go, it will dig its hooves in, it will stiffen its neck, and good luck trying to move it. Everywhere in the scripture it talks about being stiff-necked, it always uses a donkey as the example. So whenever you see stiff-necked, this has been spoken to Jews right here, familiar with donkeys, so that's why God uses the language. They understood the nature of a stiff-necked donkey. So when God says, don't you be stiff-necked, he's saying, don't you be like a donkey. Don't you be so stubborn and so self-willed that you will not be redirected by me. You know, that you'll dig your heels in and just, <coughs> no. We're forbidden to do that. Boy, because it's stubborn and self-serving and born of pride, that's why. It says, do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome, who shows what? No partiality, no favoritism, and accepts no bribes. He can't be bought off. If you want your will instead of his, you would try and offer him and say, well, you know, let me do what I want instead, and I'll do this and I'll do that. What will God say? Do you think you can buy me? You think you can bribe me? No? Are you going to do my will or not? You're going to be a donkey. He accepts no bribes. Why? Because when God says it's right, what is it? It's right. When God says it's not good for you, no. What does he mean? He means it's not good for you. No. Don't argue. Because he, we only see in part and understand in part, but he is never confused. He knows what is right and what is best. That's why he's impartial. But look about his nature, what it says next. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the foreigner residing among you. To a Jew, a foreigner means someone outside the covenant. Right? He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing, and you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. He tells us we have to love those who are not of us, who are still enslaved in Egypt. But look at the motivation. He tells us the motivation. Why? Because you were once slaves. You know what it was to be unsaved. You know what it was to not know him. You know what it is to be lost and confused and have no map before you are saved. You know? Therefore God commands that you not act with favoritism. You should be Christ-like to the lost as well as to the saved. You should not hold back justice from anybody. You should not hold back mercy from anybody. You know, and since God defends the cause of widows and orphans, what should we do? What's a widow, by the way? Does anyone know the law about widows? How do you get to be a widow? So if these two were married and Josh inconveniently died, what was the Jewish law? Get ready to marry Joseph. That was the law. Why? Anyone know? It's an entirely pragmatic thing. Why? Land. God gave the land to each tribe and then within the tribe, each family had their own land. That had to be preserved, right? The land stayed with the sons. So if Josh died, you've got the land, but you're only in the family by virtue of the marriage, right? To make sure 
that your children did not lose that some other male in the family was expected to take you in as a wife and to run the land in stewardship until your children were old enough to own it themselves. So it would go back to Josh's children as if he inherited it, uh, as if he left it to them directly. But in the meantime, you would get like this caretaker husband. You wouldn't leave the family. <coughs> one of the other men, one of his brothers would take responsibility for you and your children and the land so that the children could you know, it would circle back and go be back in the hands of the right people going on, right? To be counted a widow is only when you run out of brothers. Only if there was no one that could take you in. Maybe they didn't have any brothers. Or maybe they already had too many wives and they just couldn't really, really couldn't take you in. What does the law say then? Because you still get married. What does the law say then? It says that then the whole community had to tr take the role of the husband. So if none of his brothers could substitute for Josh inconveniently dying, then the whole community had to step into that responsibility. So the law required God's people to look after the widows, but to be a widow, you had to genuinely be without anyone else that could help you. And then God himself would be your husband through the entire community. Does that make sense? That tells you what we should be like. <coughs> Someone who's got no parents, a, real, a genuine orphan, a genuine widow, those who are alone, those who don't have anybody. Whose responsibility are they according to God? His law. Ours. Does Jesus change anything about that? No. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. They're a body part. However you treat them is how you're treating me. Do you understand? The law and what Jesus teaches are the same. One is expressed as a legal rule. Jesus expresses it as an attitude of heart and a responsibility. But the core of it is identical. Can anyone guess why? What can you say about everything in the law? Everything in the law tells you something about the character of God that doesn't change. So unsurprisingly, the character of Jesus complies with the law because the law actually is a whole lot of rules that tell you, that hint to you about the whole character of God. So when Jesus comes as a law embodied in a person, he shows us the ideal law keeper. Not doing it like someone who comply with the road rules, but doing it as driven by Christ-likeness, by, in his case, father-likeness. The son acting in reflection of his father. So right from the Old Testament, God forbids partiality. He does not permit it at all. Notice then, we read earlier that his, um, it says, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. That's back in James. But notice Deuteronomy says the same thing. Those who are poor in the eyes of the world. <coughs> Deuteronomy 10 commands us to look after them, the widows and the orphans. God's concern is always for the least, the most vulnerable, those who cannot help themselves. God is all the more their help. So if we are to reflect him, we have to have that same attitude. Does that make sense? So... We must be impartial, but we must be sensitive to the fact that if someone is very poor or alone or things like that, even though we 
should just have that one impartial standard, Christ-likeness. It is valid to say that, that the urgency to be Christ-like is all the more for someone in those circumstances because God has expressed himself plainly, Old Testament and New, that those parts that the world treats as the least important, discarded to the side, are all the more important to him. Does that make sense? Yeah. I said to someone on Facebook today, he was getting sick of, uh, you know, the big, like the rock concert at church, and like, is this encountering God? And I said, if you really want to encounter Jesus, where should you sit? Where should you sit to really encounter Jesus? If you want to sit with Jesus and really encounter him, where do you go? Well, you go and sit with an orphan. You go and sit with a widow. You go and sit with someone who's afraid and alone, hurt or confused. You go and sit with someone who's been abused. You go and sit with someone who's lost. Why? Where do you think Jesus will be sitting? In the church at a rock concert? No. Outside for that person, the one that's not invited inside. I used to have a classic cartoon on my wall. It's of a big church steps and there's an old hobo with blowflies around him. You know, and there's a wine bottle and there's all these people in suits filing into the church and there's Jesus sitting on the steps with the hobo and Jesus saying to him, don't worry, they don't let me in there either. You know, where's Jesus? So often he's not in your rock concert at church. He's not in your waving your incense or any of that stuff. He's where he said he'd be the widows and the orphans, with those who are alone, those who are oppressed. You know, he takes up the cause of the oppressed to win it. That's where you'll find him. If you want to be close to Jesus, go to where Jesus goes and sit with him there with them. Now, he says something that seems slightly odd. In James 2, he says, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? What does he mean? What is a rich person? The inclination is to think someone with a lot of money, right? But does that mean it's sinful to be rich? If you're a Christian and somehow that idea you had that you sold made you $20 million, a bit of software or something you came up with, should you now live in panic that you're not going to heaven anymore because all of a sudden you're rich? Of course not. It's got nothing to do with how much money you've got, as it turns out. Let's look and see what he means. Matthew 19, bottom of page 4. We all know this one. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. And then in James 6, But woe to you who are rich! You are receiving your comfort here now in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, you're going to go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you will mourn and weep. And James chapter 1 this time, verse 9. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed in the same way the rich will fade away even while they go about their business you believe that if you compare in 19 the mid 70s if you compare the 20 largest companies in the world the richest most powerful countries companies in the world in the mid 70s guess how many of them still exist three 
three. And they are nearly broke. Riches do not last. They don't. Why is... What, what unifies these rich people here? What is the thing that is God has a problem with? It's not, I'll give you a clue. It's not the amount of money they have. James, uh, sorry, um, oh, I put James 6, sorry, that's supposed to be um, Luke 6, don't know why I did that, so, so where it says James 6 verse 24, that should be Luke 6, sorry, that's my brain going for a wander. Why does, say, why does God say, woe to you rich, you've had your reward in full? What's their problem? Why is it harder for a rich man to enter heaven than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle? Why? We need to understand. All night we've been talking about heart attitude. It's the same here. Why doesn't a rich man easily enter the kingdom? Why is it so hard for someone who's got Let's say you're one of these like Tom Cruise types, right? So you got the looks, you got the millions of dollars, you got the talent, blah blah blah. Got the big house, everything, everything the world could offer. And someone says, "You need to be saved." What happens in your head? What happens in the head? Nothing. Why? They go, I don't need anything. I don't need Jesus. I don't need to go to your church. What do you mean I need something? I've got everything. You know? Especially when they find out that they might have to give it up, that God might require them to take up their cross and follow him. What makes it hard for what the Bible calls the rich man is the belief that he doesn't need salvation. Their comfort blinds them to their true state. Yes, it's idolatry of money. Yes, it's all those things. But deep down, the real problem is they are self-deceived about their true condition. They don't realise that they are poor because... They've got too much money in the bank to realise their poverty. Do you understand? And it's the same when we did, recently we talked about living to please God, not man, because if you're living for the praise of people, people who want you to love them back will lie to you. You can't trust the praise of people. That's why so many, like we talked about K-pop stars, they end up killing themselves, right, in spite of having millions of fans and leaving suicide notes that express how lonely and all the rest of it they are, right? How could it be you've got all these fans? Because deep down they know that the fans don't really know them. They only know the image that they sell, right? Famous people or successful people can be the loneliest, most miserable people on the planet. Your own success becomes a prison cell, you know? Rich according to the world, poor according to God. So this is what actually what James is talking about. The rich who are exploiting you, he's talking about those who have this rich man's heart attitude. It may be that they're also financially rich, but that's a you know incidental thing. He's talking about people who are exploiting you because they have the heart attitude of a biblically rich person. <coughs> and why do they blaspheme Jesus? They don't think they need him. They think you're a joke. What do you mean I need salvation? I don't need salvation. Have you seen my bank balance? Even if their bank balance isn't huge, you can have people have that same attitude just because they're good looking. Just because the girls run after them or something, they think, oh, I don't need, I've got everything I want. 
that's what this scripture is telling us. That's what James is warning us about. And he's telling us we mustn't show special favoritism toward them. Why? Well, it's simple. It's not just the de- it's not just to protect the poor. I've seen this in church so often, especially in the youth, where you know it's already bad enough if you're not musically talented and you're in one of those churches where the music team are like the little rock stars, the special people, right? So if you're not musically talented, if you are doomed to sit in the audience the whole time because you don't, you can't even play the triangle, then it's already you already feel like the second class citizen as it is. But I've experienced this, right? What if, what if some well-known Christian rock band comes and visits the church, right? And the whole church goes la-la, falling over themselves to treat these musicians like gods. How do you feel now if you're one of those people in the back row? This is what James is saying. He forbids it. You are not allowed to show special favoritism to anyone because of the effect it has on, you know, me, the guy that can't play the guitar. You know, you are not to do that. Why? Because it reinforces the attitude of the world, not the attitude of God. So when the church does it, when the church reinforces to them that, well, you don't really count because you don't have these, you know, you can't sing. When the church is supposed to represent Jesus, who's impartial, sends a message to them that actually, you know, you count less. If only you could sing like them, then you'd count. But since you can't sing, you don't count. It sends God crazy. It blasphemes him. It slanders him. In the hearts of the very people that he cares about more. Or in the sense that, you know, that he's promised to be with. He's promised to be with the lonely. He's promised to be with those people. And there in his own house, if his own people reflect the world instead of him, (coughs) is God happy? Oh, no. So we must take that heavily ourselves. We must not allow ourselves to slip into it. What's the cure? Same as always, apply the one standard. Do not permit yourself to treat people different. You know? No. It's the same with, like I was saying about you know when I ran into the head of the Dominican order or whatever and he stuck his puffy finger out with his ring on so I could kiss it, you know? No. James says that such a person needs to appreciate, if you've got, if you're a wealthy Christian, James tells you about it. If you're a wealthy Christian, what's your attitude supposed to be? He says you should Embrace your humility. Why? Because it's embarrassing being a rich Christian. Does this mean you should give your money away? Not necessarily, but how should you treat it then? It's not yours. Hold it as a steward accountable to God for how you use it. You know? Because the real problem is the rich man attitude. You know? So you see your wealth as a burden, a load that you have to give account to God for. Not as this benefit that means, well, I see I don't need you anymore, Lord, because now I've got money. Do you understand? So, yeah, it's it's okay to be a Christian millionaire so long as you don't have a rich man's attitude. How about the poor? 
Well, we saw that. It, we saw that also in the Beatitudes, right? Like in Luke, where it should have said Luke 6, not James 6. That was just my bad typing. What does the Beatitude say? Blessed are the poor, for the kingdom belongs to them. Woe to you, rich. You've already had your reward here, right? Everything in Scripture tells you that if you're in hard circumstances, if you're poor, the kingdom is prepared for you. Jesus came for you. It goes back to Ezekiel 34 again, which you should all be so familiar with now. Jesus comes to rescue the trampled and the starved and the deprived flock from the fat sheep, from those who are trampling them, right? The kingdom where he takes them is made for them. So it's not shameful to be poor as a Christian. It's a blessing, actually. If you're wealthy as a Christian, unless you want it to get you into trouble, really, if you can't learn humility and to treat it as a stewardship, that it's God's money, not yours, and you're going to have to account to him by what you do with it, then you're better to give it away before it gets you into trouble, right? So that's why James talks about the rich having to be humble. They, it's quite difficult. It's harder to be rich, or harder to be a rich Christian than to be a poor one because you're the anomaly, <laughs> you know? And God does create them, but when you know it's really God, there are, you know, Morial Ministries, I'm sure Jacob won't mind saying that, me saying that, there are some supporters of Morial in the States who are billionaires. Billionaires. They just can't help but make money because they've got huge family ranches in Texas and places like that, right, that are massive, massive money-making machines. Even if they did nothing, the money almost prints itself, right? But they're real disciples. So they give it away as fast as they make it. They can't give it away fast enough. They're still billionaires, but you know what I mean? They treat it as a burden, a ministry, that they can't think of this money as theirs. You know? It takes a special kind of understanding to be a wealthy Christian. But again, it's all about the heart attitude all about that so over on page 6 I think we can drop down to in James 2 again it says so speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty for judgment will be for judgment will be merciless for anyone who does not show mercy mercy triumphs over judgment what on earth is he talking about? What on earth is he talking about? What is the law of liberty? Says it right there, right? We should know. Well, as usual, we need to understand this as one package. If anyone refuses to show mercy, no mercy will be shown to them by God. Remember, forgive. Then what? Everyone knows the Lord's Prayer, right? And in it, forget, forgive my sins as I have forgiven others. Does anyone know what's in the Scripture immediately after that prayer? If you go over and read it in your Bible later. What you'll see is the very next thing. It says, "If anyone refuses to be to forgive, neither will their sins be forgiven them." Right. So if the measure you use is partial, partiality, so you forgive when it suits and then when it doesn't suit you, you don't. You have like double standard. God says, if you refuse mercy, no mercy will be shown to you. If that's the measure you choose, right? What is this law then that leads to liberty? It's simple. It's Christ-likeness. 
Remember what I said from Deuteronomy 10? The law, the Old Testament law, explains the character of God, but in a mechanical kind of way that we can't keep perfectly. The character of Jesus is the law alive, demonstrated. The law that leads to liberty is Christ-likeness. Whoever seeks to be Christ-like, to not just know what he said, but to live by it, is someone who's seeking to be law-abiding under the New Testament in the sight of God. It links into things like what John says, that when Jesus said, whoever keeps my commands is the one that loves me. Right? So we are not lawless. When, it's, when Paul says that the law is ended, now we're under grace, he's talking about ritual law. He's talking about the sacrifices in the temple, the things that were only foreshadowing the real Jesus. But the rest of the law, so we don't do those ritual things, right? We don't need to because we've got the real thing now. But the rest of God's law, like Deuteronomy 10, the duty to take care of widows and orphans, the duty to be impartial in your judging, impartial in your mercy, those things don't change. That is still the law. And Jesus expresses all of it in his character. So that's what James is talking about. You can't show partiality. You must have this one measure. You must remember that you're going to be judged according to our law. What law? His character. Are you really his disciple? Are you a sheep or a goat? Remember Matthew 25? The one that remembered, the least person that bought the cup of cold water, that visited me when I was in prison, that gave me something to eat when I had no food. When you were doing that, you were really doing it for me, Jesus says. You know, that's what separated the sheep from the goats. What does that make? What, what is it they were doing? They've been Christ like. Deuteronomy 10, the law explains why that's Christ like. Jesus fulfills the law. He is the law in person. Is this making sense? So whilst James appears to be using like code, it's actually all he means. Live as people who are going to be judged, but not by the Mosaic law, but by a different, st but by something that's the same standard, but a standard that we can meet. You know, that our goal is to be Christ-like, just that one measure all the time. One measure all the time. Now, our last bit from James, um, and it's pretty quick because it's pretty easy. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Question mark. He's asking a question. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their actual need, what good is it? What do your words achieve? Nothing. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, I have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So what are we to take from this? The first thing is, he's unequivocal, right? Faith without deeds is dead. And we know the answer to this because... I've taught it to a gazillion times. The word faith, pistis in Greek, emuna in Hebrew, Old Testament and New, they have the same meaning. Whether it's pistis in Greek or emuna in Hebrew, it <coughs> means to believe and to act on the belief. It never believe, It never means one or the other. It always and every time, 100%, means both. To the extent that they never bothered having separate words. Why? 
because in both cultures it was considered that you couldn't have one without the other. If you claim to have one without the other, the one you claim to have you didn't really have. And the way it was always expressed to me, the plane is crashing, and they said, the only way out, we've got to jump. And the guy says, well, I've got a parachute. I believe in parachutes. And everyone else is jumping out with a parachute. And he's still saying, I'll be all right. I've got a parachute, and I believe in parachutes. But he doesn't put it on, and he doesn't jump. What's his problem? OK, so you believe in parachutes. That's a good thing. But do you really believe in it? Because if you really believed in it, you'd put it on and jump out and be saved. Faith without deeds consistent with that faith is meaningless. And then he says at the bottom there, even the demons believe that and shudder. This is to reinforce the point. When Jesus steps out of the boat and there's a guy who's been kept in chains, right? Because he manifests all these demons so the local people keep him chained up, right? You know the story well. There's many, many demons, right? As the demon that speaks attests for himself. The one that speaks for all the demons, his name is what? Legion, right? Some people speculate, and it may be true, that because legion is a Roman army term, and a legion is about between 1,000 and 5,000 soldiers, that's a lot of demons, right? If, if the name reflects how many demons he's speaking for. The disciples with Jesus suspect that he's special, right? Do they know he's the son of God yet? They don't, do they? They probably have their suspicions, but they haven't come out right out. We're not in that part of the story yet. But this demon, speaking for the other demons, how does he address Jesus as soon as he sees him? It's actually down here in Mark 5 at the bottom of page 6. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed before him, and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other? This is Legion talking. What does he say? Jesus, son of the most high God. The demon has no doubt at all who Jesus is. The demon is terrified. He says, I implore you by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit, and was, uh, and was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out. Long before any of the disciples were sure, here we have a demon, and his first response is to bow down, And beg, don't torture me. Don't send us out. This demon's terrified. Why? Because he recognizes not a carpenter from Nazareth. He calls him by his proper name. Jesus, son of the most high God. We plead with you, do not torment us. Right? Right? This is what James is getting at. The, before the fall, before Satan rebelled, what are the demons? Hush a demon, Hebrew. What are the demons? Angels, right? So if you like by DNA, not that angels probably have DNA, but if you think of it that way, by species... Demons are no different than Gabriel and Michael, right? They are angels. So there are the angels, the two-thirds of the angels that serve God and the one-third that rebelled, right? 
But that means that long before the creation of Adam and Eve, where are these angels? They're in the presence of God. Who else is in the presence of God? Jesus at his right hand. So for millennia upon a millennia, every single demon has looked face to face upon the Ancient of Days and his son. Right? They have no doubt, if, you, if only you had the certainty of a demon about who Jesus was, right? That's how much they know. Is it saving them? Is that knowledge saving them? If faith was just faith, as people talk about it in English, just believing, who, who could possibly believe Jesus was the son of God more than a demon who's seen him in heaven face to face sitting next to God? You haven't. I haven't. The demons have. If faith just means that, every demon should be happy, good as gold, right? They're not guessing. They know. <laughs> Is it saving them? No. Why? Because in spite of that knowledge, they refuse to repent. They will not obey. They are in rebellion. In spite of belief, who he is, right? That's what James is saying. Faith without the work, the deeds that go with the belief, is dead. When it says dead, it's a word necros. Necros in Greek means completely without life. You know, not mostly dead. If you ever seen the movie The Prince's Bride, you know I'm quoting. He's not mostly dead. He's not in that. There's a guy who think he's dead, and they, the physicians ask to bring him back to life, and they check, and says, "Oh, you're in luck. He's not dead. He's only mostly dead. You know, so I can do something." No, necros doesn't mean mostly dead. It means absolutely devoid of life. Right? That's what the word that James uses to describe faith without the action that's consistent with the faith. Discipleship. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you are a sheep and not a goat, you'll have done these things for me when you did it for the least of my people. You will have reflected me in your action. You'll have reflected me in your being, who you are without showing any partiality to who's in front of you. Right? Where does this lead us? Somebody this. Jesus is saying, this is about who you are, not about who you act. If your focus is to be Christian, then you won't care who's in front of you. You'll be being you. You won't change who you are depending on the audience. You'll be Christian you, regardless of the audience. Whether you're sitting with a great man or a small man, or with a widow and an orphan, or the leader of the, you know, the praise band, where it won't make an iota of difference to you. It won't matter if someone famous comes in or someone no one knows. It won't change how you behave at all because your focus is to be his, the bride who's making herself ready, who wants to just have one standard, one measure, Christ-likeness. Not just to know, but to act on what you know. Does this make sense, I hope? Yeah. I put one last teaching at the bottom, which I think we will just quickly do, from Luke 16. Because it's on the issue of faith. Now I've heard lots of sermons and lots of, been in lots of church meetings and heard lots of prayers where people think that they want God to move right, but he's not moving. And they will say wrongly, well, we need more faith. 
we need more faith. Faith. We can't have enough faith. Faith. Can we? Okay, so the camera's wondering, faith is sitting right there. Um, faith, when they talk about it like that, they talk about it like some sort of mystical power. You know? That if we just have enough faith, is a faith with some sort of energy or something, right? Nonsense. Faith is what faith is in the scripture. It's knowing the truth and acting consistent with it. Remember the guy casting out the demons? How did he have enough faith? What mattered was he was doing it in the character of Jesus. That's where the authority came from. In the character of Jesus, as a proxy for Jesus, consistent with Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with him to do what the guy was moved to do. He said the words, the Holy Spirit is the one that does the casting out, right? If you don't have enough faith, it doesn't mean you need more belief. It means you need more compliance. God is waiting for you to act on the faith that you already have. Faith is always the action that goes with the belief. If you just get more and more and more and more wise, but you don't act on it, you are a library no one else no one ever visits you know where all this wonderful understanding is written down in dusty books that no one ever takes out you don't want to be the wisest corpse in the cemetery you know faith must have the deeds that go with it so how, how can I get you know how, why, what would make God trust me with like the authority to cast out a demon or something right why would he well the first thing is he only does things like that when that's what he needs to happen for someone else to gain faith when they need to see something to get them over the line if you remember if needs be god could use a donkey that if he uses you it's a blessing so that's the first thing right but the second thing is there are some things that require maturity if you want more of the Holy Spirit, even that saying is a nonsense, right? You either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. So more properly, if you wish God to use you and to, and to bring you into deeper things of him, more mature things of him, there's a rule. And you find it in Luke 16 on our last page, page 7. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. But whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy, uh, trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trusted with, trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Then in Matthew 25, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful with a few things. Therefore, I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. One is the, it's the same story literally the same story two different gospels one it's two sides of the same coin right so just for now forget the money angle because that's a teaching in itself understand the principle there god says if i can't see you act faithfully with a little what possesses you to think that i will entrust to you much How do you get to where God will trust you with the big stuff? Learn to be faithful with what you have. Yes, it's a bit to do with money in the context, but it's a general principle. If you want to be some great evangelist traveling overseas or a missionary, but you never speak to your friends, 
you know? If you can't share the gospel with those who know you, why will God entrust that task to you or the future people that you don't know and they don't know you? It's a general principle, right? It's actually no different than anything else in life. Before you can be entrusted with big responsibility, you have to do an apprenticeship. He gives you enough that you can deal with to practice. And when you're able to be faithful and practice that, he entrusts you with more because he's always wanting to grow you. Remember, Jesus says he's the vine, we're the branches, his father's the gardener, and he prunes the fruitful branches to make them more fruitful. It's the same thing. It's his intention to make you more. But you won't grow, you won't be more if you can't use what you, the small thing where he starts you. If you can't do something with what you already know, he's not going to entrust you with more. Let's be found faithful, not just like a library that no one visits, a whole lot of information stored safely away. Make sure that we're doing something with what we already have if we want him to add to that. You can sum up the whole message of tonight really simply be Christ-like in all circumstances. It all comes down to that. Don't allow the circumstances to dictate who you are. Let who you are dictate the circumstances. <coughs> be Christ-like in it, regardless, regardless of the audience, regardless of the situation. You are his. You belong to him, not to the world. Live to please him and not the world. Because as Matthew 25 tells us, it's going to matter when the sheep are separated from the goats. Remember those principles about looking after the body parts? You know, on account of someone belonging to him, how we treat them is how we treat him. Even the least of them is connected to the head. If they're hurting, he's hurting. If we don't care about them, we don't care about him either. He takes it personally. And in light of, you know, all the news we keep hearing about this church and that church and how they've abused their people and all the rest of it, is there any question why God is tipping those churches over? Because they are slandering and maligning his character. To rescue those people, he'll tip those churches on their head. So let's learn and understand from this and make sure that on the day when it counts, that he'll say, enter good and faithful servant, not go away from me, I don't know you. Okay, that's it. Oops, I'm in trouble because I went 15 minutes past being in trouble with the wife, but never mind. <laughs> Better in trouble with the wife than trouble with God, right? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> only just. <laughs> okay, Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that these things that ought to be understood by every, even the most new Christian, Lord, that these things ought to be the most fundamentally understood things, and yet are not. We pray and ask, Lord, that not just ourselves, but everyone, by your Spirit, Lord, would be woken up again to these things, that we would turn to each other and be Christ-like, no matter who's in front of us, and that we would know what that means by studying your word and understanding who you are, and what you require so that we will remember that we will give account in the end and it will matter whether we were really yours inwardly or just playing games help us lord grant us your holy spirit afresh stir up your spirit in us recall to our minds everything you've said so that we would be a people led by you and not wandering around lost and confused. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and that's us finished for the week. Shalom until next time. All right.